Hello, I'm Ken Burrell from Pragmatic PMO. This is one of a series of videos expanding on the Success Stories Shared initiative which was started in South Africa by Linky van der Merwe of Virtual Project Consulting and Louise Worsley of Pi Cubed and which has their enthusiastic support. Aldous Huxley said that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is one of the most important lessons of history. Project management research has shown that project managers prefer to learn from face-to-face -face interaction rather than from searching through lessons learned databases. I think that project managers can learn a lot from each other's success stories and also from sharing their scars that they get from managing ugly projects. So as part of my campaign for real project managers, on your behalf I'm talking to some real project managers I've had the pleasure of working alongside so that you can benefit from their experience. Today, I'm delighted to have with me Adam al Shemery, who's going to share some of his experiences with us. Hi Adam, I'd like you to start by introducing yourself and giving us a flavour of your background and how you got into project management. Uh, my name is Adam al Shemery. Um, I currently work for a corporate real estate firm uh, in the city. Mm. Uh, I have circa seven years experience. Uh, my initial start in the industry started um, from an undergraduate doing architecture at Plymouth University. From there I moved on to do a Bilmes Vane Masters at Kingston University, understanding the basics of buildings, um, how they're created, how they're designed and then how they're monitored, uh, gave me a good grounding for then going on to monitoring and project managing the builds. Currently I focus mainly on corporate real estate fit out projects, so this is office refurbishments uh, for corporate occupiers and they range from 10,000 square foot up to three, 400,000 square foot. So can you give us an example of a scar, so something that went wrong in an ugly project or something that was particularly challenging that you learned from? Um, so one of my previous projects, probably some two years ago now, I was working with an international based um, company. I was working alongside their UK team uh, and the task there was to move them offices. So working with their UK based team we uh, went in there with the interior designer Working with them, we worked out, we understood their needs, their requirements, we drew up the scheme, uh, we got to the basic uh, Reba stage two, which is the full concept design, which is the floor plan, what it looks like, how it would work. Uh, and prior to going to tender, um, the UK team decided that it was best to go back to their real estate team based overseas, just to kind of uh, cross check whether or not it is a suitable design for them. Uh, unfortunately, it ensued that the corporate real estate team wasn't happy with the way in which it had been designed. There was a corporate guideline that we were unaware, were unaware of, or at least I was. Uh, and what inevitably happened is that design got um, postponed temporarily. So there were a few conversations initially about what we could do to push forward on it. Uh, they had an upcoming lease event which essentially put a deadline to their program so they were under tight pressures to deliver to the program so the program I'd worked up had a bit of contingency in a couple of weeks but the point we were at was a major sticking point so we had two options really we had we could go back to the drawing board redesign it uh, and put it back out there to tender or we could look at ne negotiating with uh, one of the preferred contractors so that we would choose. You thought you had a design, yes. but then you had conflicting viewpoints on that design. Yeah, so the, the design that we produced for the UK-based team was in complete contrast to the design that the overseas real estate team wanted. So they were quite a old-fashioned, very formal company. Uh, they felt that every manager needed an office and the design that they wanted in the UK based team was based on current trends where they wanted to go for more of an agile space. They wanted complete open plan with the exception of the CEO and they wanted to have alternative work points to drop in and drop out but the corporate real estate team and their corporate guidelines was against that. There were certain size for offices it had to be, it was very regimented. So the conflict here was we were trying to design something that the corporate real estate team didn't really want. So how did you deal with that? Uh, so the first thing we did, um, I spoke to the teams about negotiating with a single contractor. So we progressed from that initial stage of the problem, so we, we, we still tendered it because we didn't have time to go back to the drawing board uh, and we tendered it in a way in which we understood what the company wanted from the contractor. So we started to look at the style and approach from the contractor. We started to get contractual rates in place. So these contractual rates was give us a basis to negotiate. So we picked, we picked a preferred contractor we believed could deliver a design. So it started to be a bit more of a design exercise, the tender. Uh, so we picked the contractor, they came on board, 
Um, the, obviously the concern was when we went to tender, we were getting apples and pears, it was very hard to compare. Um, so that was one of the big challenges we faced. Uh, at the end of this, um, at the end of the design period, we actually got to a point where there was a bit of compromise. They did give on some of the corporate guidelines, uh, but both teams were happy with the end result. What did you learn from that? What recommendation would you make to other project managers? Uh, one of the biggest challenges as you go into a kind of corporate team, um, as, a, as a project management consultant, you are a, an add-on to their essentially real estate team. So the importance here I learnt was ensuring you're challenging what they need, understanding that there's different groups of people that would have a key um, input into it. So on this occasion, I wasn't led to believe there was anyone else. I assumed, rightly or wrongly, that the client I was dealing with was empowered to make the decisions. But actually, it's important to ensure that you're asking the straightforward question, do you have a real estate team? Is there a corporate guideline that we should be using, rather than assuming that if there was, someone would show you that corporate guideline. Okay, so that was a scar. What about a success story? Um, have you got any examples of um, good practices that you use that you would recommend to other people? Um, so I'm currently working on a project for uh, a major occupier and their business is ever changing. So one of the biggest challenges we faced when we first started the project was an unknown headcount. So the, the way in which the business was growing so rapidly meant it was very hard to plan around what they needed. So from the very early outset, we tried to undertake what we were asked to do was a traditional stage four design, which is a full technical pack, all the drawings there. So you take your stage four redesign, you tender it, costs come back from contractors, you pick a selected contractor based on their quality, their price and their approach. You then issue them the contract based on those drawings. Uh, you issue a construction set based on a further worked up pack, uh, and then you go to slightly build it but that approach wasn't right for the client because their, their, their main business was run in a very agile way. So for them, they wanted the ability to change things quickly. So what we did and the approach we took was to create flexibility. So we looked at trying to tender a cat A design, which essentially for us, it was, it was a slightly enhanced version, but essentially it was a, an open plan office. We would come back at any stage as the design progressed to redesign it. So one of the challenges in that project as well was that it was phased occupation, which worked in our favour because it gave us the opportunity to redesign phase by phase. It was a bit tricky. It cost the client slightly more in terms of consultancy fees. However, they were getting, and they still continue to get, the opportunity to redesign because if we committed to a design two years prior to being built, the challenge would be their business may have moved on by two years. So would it be still fit for purpose? That was the question we asked ourselves. So, so it sounds to me like um, what you're doing there is, is uh, adopting an incremental delivery model, um, which is more commonly used in the software industry, to construction, which traditionally um, most people would say that can't be done. Yeah, so we, we had to be mindful, obviously, the certain flexibilities that construction can give you and certain inflexibilities, let's say. Mm -hmm. So construction, it's not predominantly known as a, a, an industry where you can run in an agile way. So unlike IT software programs where you can shelve it, put it to one side and cut your losses, with a construction project, if you're on site, you're halfway through, you have to continue to deliver. What did you learn from that? What recommendation would you make to other project managers? Um, challenge the client's brief. So in the construction industry, we would always say, oh, you want traditional design, let's deliver you one. But taking one step back, understanding this business strategy from the client's perspective gave us the ability to understand what they needed. So trying to deliver to something that we would always deliver a client in this situation wasn't right. So understanding the client's brief, challenging their objectives, understanding what they want out of the project would then give them something better than just saying, well, we normally just do a stage four design, right, we're designing it, we're building it, we're off. Adam, thanks for your time, your candour and your insights. So today we've heard from Adam about how he recovered from something that was going wrong and about something that worked or went well. Anton Chekhov said, knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. I think the value of learning comes not just from documenting the past, but from changing what we do in the future. So my challenge to you is what would you learn from this? What will you do differently in your projects as a result of Adam's experience? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and found it stimulating, please leave a comment or a like or both or share it with others on social media. If you think these videos are useful and interesting, I'll make more of them. If you want to appear in one, let me know. For other videos on project management topics, take a look at my video channel. 
For articles on project management and PMO topics, visit my website, pragmaticpmo.com, or follow me on Twitter, at pragmaticpmo. To connect with me more personally, search LinkedIn for Ken Burrell Pragmatic PMO. In the meantime, until the next time, thanks for watching.